my name is Tony, and you are at uh, the anatomy of a Ruby gem, going from zero to sharing code. Oops, and that just went away. Great. Off to a good start. All right. So um, I have roughly about uh, 10 years of professional Ruby development. Uh, I've authored a few gems. Some of them, to my horror, I found out are actually being used by um, actual uh, businesses. Um, I work for a company called Springbuck in Indiana, where we um, do healthcare analytics for um, insurance brokers, covering about a million lives worth of data, or at least that's what the marketing department told me to say. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about three primary points. What is a Ruby gem? Where do the gems live on your system? And how they're made and pushed up to rubygems.org. A couple quick housekeeping notes. Uh, this is more geared towards junior developers. It's going to be somewhat higher level. Some hand waving will happen. Uh, little bits of details will be dug into, but it's mostly a general idea of how gems are constructed. We're going to talk about pure Ruby gems only. No C extensions. No nothing about JRuby. Just plain old Ruby gems. And um, a quick note. Whenever you see the dollar sign, that is in a terminal window, and uh, double arrows is pretty much IRB. The reason why I primarily wanted to do this talk is I noticed something going on from the various teams I worked with in the past several years. Um, some of my supervisors see me work and they think I'm magical. My, co my coworkers think I'm pretty much Neo, and because of those two points, um, I start to get a big head and I think I'm a superhero. But at the end of the day, this is all I'm really doing. Just running require, like everybody else does. So let's start with what we know. We know how to install gems, we know how to use gems. You can uh, install a gem with gem install. We'll use awesome print as an example. Voodoo happens, gems installed, hop into IRB, require the gem, and suddenly you have the gem loaded. You can do whatever you want with it. Alternatively, you can have a gem file, pop in a gem, the name of the gem you want, run bundle, the gem is also magically installed, run bundle exec against your app, and awesome print is just there. So let's go back to the first example, gem install awesome print. Um, doesn't really tell you much of what ex exactly it's doing. Fortunately, gem install has a nice verbose flag on it, so let's just uh, run this and see what happens, and oh god no. That's, uh, that's quite a bit of stuff. Um, if you're in the back, I don't expect you to read this. Um, and if you're in the back and you can read that, please tell me the name of your eye doctor, because that'd be very impressive. So let's break this down a little bit. Here's the exact same command with a lot of the extra stuff kind of ripped out. I'm using the shortcut path to Ruby that points to the actual installation of my um, locally installed Ruby here, just to keep the lines down. But if you look up at the very top, uh, you'll see that we are doing a normal web git request to rubygems.org. Uh, we're pulling down a file called awesomeprint.gem with a version number attached to it. And we start just listing files. At the very top you notice you have a license, a readme, and then you just see some regular Ruby files. And further down you even start seeing some spec files. And then gem tells you it's done and you have the gem installed. So these are just Ruby files. Yeah, so um, hate to spoil it for everyone, there's not really much magic here. R gems are just plain old Ruby files. They look like Ruby files, they're read like Ruby files, they're executed like Ruby files. And they're downloaded in what's called a gem file, which I'm sorry to say is just a zip file renamed. Specifically, it's a gzip file. So you're dealing with a zip file full of files and that's the entirety of the gem, pretty much. And yes, there's some, sometimes there's C in there, sometimes there's Java in there, we're, we're not gonna worry about that right now. So that's how gems get there. And if you notice in the previous ver, uh, verbose command, you saw where all these files are being uh, plopped. Uh, in this particular case, I'm using rbm for my locally installed gems and home rvm versions and then the version of Ruby is where the gem is, in, is where Ruby is installed. And further down you'll see a lib directory, a Ruby directory, a gems directory, the version of, of Ruby uh, that's installed, and then an actual, finally, a gems directory. This is the standard install for pretty much any system Ruby out there. 
uh, as far as where gyms live by default. And all of these listed are all of the gyms installed on my local system. And as you can see that there are multiple versions of the same gym actually installed. Ruby will put the, um, each gym as well as each individual version that you install in its own separate directory organized with, between, with a dash and the actual version number. This is how Ruby can know which specific versions of gyms to actually load up. So we know how they, they're installed, we know where they live. How do you tell Ruby to actually load them up? Well, there are two ways to do this. Start up IRB, you can start the Ruby package, uh, Ruby gyms package with a simple require. Uh, then you require the gym that you want and you have it right there. In this case, I'm loading up the IE18N gym and unless you tell it otherwise, you will always get the latest version installed on your system. In this case, this is 1.1.0. Uh, technically, you do not need to require Ruby gyms anymore since 1.9. This is mostly just for historical purposes. Um, if you go online, you may see a couple of the older example scripts manually requiring Ruby, manually requiring Ruby gems. That is no longer needed. Alternatively, if you need to actually load up a specific version of a gem, there is actually a gem method that comes with Ruby gems. Uh, you may notice this looks like the exact same syntax as you would put in a gem file. That's because a gem file is actually a glorified Ruby file that's read as Ruby. You can specify a um, you can, uh, a gem to use and the actual version to, you, uh, to run against. This is what's called activating a gem. So if you ever run a bundle exec on a rake command and you, it's complaining about certain gems are activated before anything else, this is bundler saying, you told me to explicitly load up this gem, but something further up the chain already activated another gem, please fix. Um, quick note. Um, never actually run the gym method, that's what bundler is for, but it's just there if you ever, ever actually want to do a one-off script and you want a very specific version of the gym. So in this case, I'm explicitly loading up IE18N version 0.9.3. So that's how gyms are loaded up. We went through how gyms are installed and where they live, but what exactly makes a gym? That's the whole point of this talk. A gem, the best way I could describe it is four parts. A gem spec file, a tweak to the load path, um, the activation, which is handled by Ruby gems and Bundler, and somewhere along the line, a well-placed require to actually start using the gem. The gem spec is the primary focus of the gem. It is what, it describes the gem both to rubygems.org and to the actual uh, Ruby process. It has a name, description, a version number, lists its dependencies, what things need to be loaded up before this gym could be loaded up. Uh, similar to Rails, it, um, Ruby gems are, have a very strong convention. Um, the gem spec file is typically named the same as your gem name, dot gem spec, but really gym, a gem spec file is just Ruby code. Nothing too interesting about it other than it's, uh, it issues certain methods in a certain way to um, describe the gem to the system. And here is a default gem spec that you can generate. This is pretty much all you need to get a gem set up, um, set up and running as far as describing it. Um, let's start at the top and let's start with the anti-pattern. Great. So there needs to be a way to tell the uh, gym spec to tell Ruby gyms what version of this gym is. You may notice working with various gyms over the years that you have a constant name to the gym, colon, colon, and then a version constant after, uh, within that. And it'll spit back out a version. This is how uh, other gym authors and um, c developers can ask the gym, what version are you on? So if I know I need to do something different between different versions, I can do so here. But as developers, we don't want to repeat ourselves, so why should we mainly write out to the version and then write out the version inside some um, Ruby constant for developers to use? Let's use both at the same time. Well, to do this, we need to tell Ruby how to actually load the file that has the version number in it. And to do that, you have to tweak the load path Dollar sign load path is a global in Ruby that lists out an array of every directory that the current running Ruby process knows about. So when you run require and then some file, it will look through all those directories and try to find a matching file. First one in wins. 
And if it can't find it, that's where you get the um, I don't know what this file is type of error. So because Ruby doesn't fully know about the gem yet, you have to mainly tweak the load path, explicitly, uh, explicitly require the version um, file, and then it's available for the rest of the parsing of the gem spec. This is boilerplate. Don't ever touch the load path. You could screw some stuff up, but it's there. Further down, we invoke the gem specification object. This comes with Ruby, uh, the Ruby gems package. This is the thing that actually describes what the gem is to the system. It is a series of um, methods that you uh, um, call and configure. Uh, Bundler has a lot of documentation about what each one of these do. Um, the top of the gem specification commonly has the name of the gem, uh, the uh, who made it, an array of authors, an array of emails for the authors, um, short and long descriptions that actually will go to the rubygems.org file, as well as a license, a home page, which is commonly directly linked to the uh, GitHub repo, and just other basic meta information for humans to read. So the top of the gem spec is for humans to understand. And the bottom of the gem spec describes the gem to the computers, or specifically the Ruby process. The uh, files method will in, um, instruct Ruby gems. These are all the files that actually make up this gem. Um, you may have noticed in the um, um, awesome print example, we're pulling down a uh, readme file, all the spec files, a bunch of plain text files. Nowadays, when gems are packaged up, they don't include that. Um, so this pattern is used typically, um, you're assuming, it's assuming you're on a Unix-like system, it's gonna shell out to get, do a couple uh, magical flags and just pull out all the normal RB files that the gem actually uses. So it ignores the readme and ignores the uh, test files. Uh, Binder is commonly where executable scripts are go, so the rake uh, command, the rails command, uh, the bundler command for the bundle gem, um, these are then appended to, I believe, the uh, operating system path. So when the gem is loaded up or the gem is activated, um, you can hop into a terminal and actually execute them, and that's where those typically um, live. And then also a listing of the actual executable files with the ex executable method. Require paths, this is commonly never touched, but um, it lists out the directories that Ruby gems will expose inside of the gem Commonly, everything is thrown in lib. Um, that's more or less convention nowadays. I believe it will even use lib if you don't specify any directories by default. And then finally, you actually have the dependencies. There are two types of dependencies in a gem spec. You have runtime and development. Uh, runtime are gems that have to be installed and activated before the gem is actually loaded up. So in this particular example, we need the Postgres gem at least version 019 in order for the gem to actually install and work. If we're just working on the gem locally, we also have de uh, development dependencies. In this case, we want rake version 10.0, roughly around that side, uh, roughly around that. And I think I even, yeah, I had arrows. Oh well. Yeah. It's pretty much straightforward. So you have the gem spec, you have the load path, which is in lib, and then we have what's called an entry file, and this is what actually makes a gem. A entry file is typically a Ruby file named the same thing as your gem, similar to your gem spec, inside of the directory that is uh, required. In this case, we have a gem, uh, gem spec, my gem dot gem spec. We have a lib directory, which the gem spec says to require. Inside the lib directory, we immediately have my gem dot rb. That is the file that is actually parsed when the gem is um, um, required in the system. Inside a lib, uh, you will commonly have a bunch of extra subdirectories to hold ex um, support files. Um, in this case, we have the default version file, which just has the constant version within a uh, namespace that lists out the current version of the gem, and that is the um, file that is hacked into the gem spec to load up to not have to change the version number in two places. And that is pretty much a gem um, all in and of itself. Uh, so let's uh, get, try to make a gem real quick. Um, and by try, I mean I have slides of pre-made code because we're not doing live coding for this. 
Um, we're gonna make a gem called RB21, which is a very simple implementation of the game of 21, also known as Blackjack. We're not going to implement too much of the game, just mostly the foundation of it, so a, later on an actual game could be made possibly. We're gonna have a card that has a value in a suit. We're going to have a deck which holds cards, it can shuffle the cards, it can deal out the cards, it keeps track of how many um, are discarded. And we're gonna have a hand that holds cards and the hand can then say, do I have a blackjack, am I busted, what is the current value of the cards, stuff like that. I'm not gonna worry about splitting, doubling, no betting, no hit, um, you can hit by drawing a card, no standing, it's just keep going until you basically you lose, I suppose. Just to build out a very simple structure, pretty much. Uh, for this example, um, I'm using Ruby 2.5.1 as well as the, at the time, the uh, latest version of Bundler, which is 1.16.5. I'm explicitly calling out Bundler because we're gonna have Bundler actually make a lot of the files for us. So back in the day, we had, you had to know, all right, I need a gem spec file. It needs to be this tall, it needs all these different methods. I have to dig through five different uh, pages of documentation for, um, I need to know to have the lib directory, I need to have my entry file, you don't need to worry about that anymore. Nowadays you can actually have Bundler scaffold a blank gem for you. And as different versions of Bundler's release, some of these default files are tweaked slightly. Um, one day I hope they get rid of the uh, load path hack and the gem spec, but today is not that day. Um, I believe 1.17 is out, so some of these uh, screens may vary slightly, but effectively they're all identical. There's not much variation. So in my handy terminal window, we're going to say bundle gym and then the name of the gym. First time you ever build a gym on your system, it'll ask you a series of questions and save them for next time. First it'll ask, um, you wanna do tests for your gym? And the answer is always yes, you want tests for your gym. It'll ask if you want no gyms, which is we're not doing, oh, no tests, which we're not doing. Or you can use RSpec in mini test, pre bootstrap that up if you want. In this case, we're gonna say RSpec. It'll then ask, hey, you want a license for this gym? The answer is usually yes, and um, it will give you a copy of the MIT gym by default if you want, and pre-populate to the license value in the gym spec. We'll just default to MIT for now. It'll ask if you want a code of conduct to post on GitHub. We'll say yes to that. And then it scrolls through a bunch of files. It then automatically initializes a Git repo for you. It won't point to anything, so you have to actually say, I want this to, I want master and origin to be on GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab or wherever it is you want to actually host these files. And you're done pretty much. If we look inside of the directory that was just made for us, we have a gem file, we have our entry file, we have our version file, we have a gem spec and a bunch of other stuff that we can use to help build the gym. Uh, as I mentioned, it already initialized a um, git repo for us, so we have a git ignore file. Uh, we want rspec, so we have a .rspec uh, default file for us. Um, also, it's going to throw us a Travis file, so we can have CI just out of the box if we wanted to. We have a readme, we have some bin files and a rake file. We have a rake file, let's see what's all about that. We are given uh, four rake tasks right off the bat that we can just use. We can build our gem file, which again is just a gzip file. We can then take our uh, uh, gem file and install it locally, so we can actually mess around with it with system Ruby. We can re release the gem into the wild to rubygems.org, and this will actually make a git tag for us, push that up to our git repo, and push that up to rubygems.org so everyone can use it as well as your standard rake spec command, which will run our specs or rake test if you're using mini test. So we have that structure. Let's build the gym. So I sketched out, took about roughly an hour to do this, um, the various classes that are needed to implement um, 21 at the most basic level. I'm not gonna go into the actual code because we don't care about that, we just wanna build the gym. And this, will, this is also available on GitHub for people to see as well, but we're gonna implement a card, we're gonna implement a deck, we have our uh, hand class on the far right, and then the two default files that uh, Bundler gave us, which is the version file, as well as the entry file. 
the entry file by default only has uh, require uh, the version file as well as an empty um, namespace. And if you really, really wanted to, you can get rid of the version file, you can manually put in the version in the um, gem spec and have your entire gem just be one giant file if you really wanted to. Some gems actually implement, are implemented like that. Otherwise, be, because you have the lib directory already loaded in your load paths, you can then start requiring everything in subdirectories to actually uh, bootstrap the gem. This is where you all also want to uh, manually require any of your dependency gems as well. So if you need Postgres uh, for whatever reason, you want to require PG right here, um, the gem spec guarantees that Postgres is already loaded up and ready to go for you. So you just have to load it. And we wrote our code, we wrote some tests. Just pretend this is green text. Um, tests all passed, trust me, these are not red lines. So we wrote code, we wrote tests. What else can we do with this? Well, we can also just mess, with, mess around with the gym ourselves. Uh, Bundler makes a bin directory for us. One of the files in there is called console. This is a standard um, Unix executable, executable file, and when you load it up, it will automatically bootstrap up your entire gem for you inside of a IRB uh, terminal. This allows you to just mess around with your classes. You don't need to write certain, you know, you don't need to write one-off specs just to see if a certain method works. You can just, it's your playground pretty much. Because it's also IRB, you can mainly require in other gems if you want or just pretty much do whatever you want. And I wish, I wish all gyms had this. Um, I think this was added roughly a few years ago by Bundler, I think. I think Ernie Miller went on a small um, uh, blog rant about every gym should have this and someone just copied it and now it's part of Bundler, which is great. Um, the other file in the bin directory is a set, setup file, which by default will run Bundler and say you're done. This is for developers where you pull down the gem from um, the Git repo if you want to uh, develop it or um, contribute bug fixes. You can issue uh, bin slash setup and it'll make sure all of the development dependencies and all the runtime dependencies are pre-installed and the gem author can issue more commands in the setup script to set up certain things if you need to, like maybe set up a default MySQL database or what have you. So we wrote, this, we wrote the gem, we wrote the specs, we messed around with it, we feel pretty confident with this. Let's, uh, let's release this to the outside world. Rake release, fantastic. All right, we're going to run this. Bundler will build our gem file in a package directory, which is automatically git ignored by the default git ignore file. It'll make a git tag for the version that we are uh, publishing our gem. So in this case, 0.1.0. And it does a one final git push up to origin, as long as, uh, along with all the tags, so everything is on um, your git repo and you're ready to go. And well, it blew up. So the first time you actually try to release a gem, it's gonna say, yo, um, Ruby gems needs to know uh, who you are. So you can go to rubygems.org, you can set up a very simple account, just email and password, and this allows you to have access to all of the gems that you've published on rubygems to help keep track of them and also basically flag who actually pushed the stuff up. You can set up multiple contributors to a gem, so if I'm working on a gem and another developer is working on the same gem and I give push uh, access to it, um, he can commit the gem um, under his account and it'll all go to the same bucket. So we need to actually tell rubygems.org who we are, so it says run gem push to set our credentials. Let's assume we already made our account, so let's run gem push. It asks for our email and password, it stores it in an encrypted manner locally so you don't need to set this every time. And that also aired out. So this is kind of an awkward way to um, push gems for the first time. The Previous command told us to um, run gem push to set our gems, or, or rubygems.org credentials. And when we run gem push, it's like, thanks for the credentials, but what gem are you pushing? Uh, this is because Bundler and RubyGems are still separate projects, I believe, in 
2.6, I believe they're trying again to merge Bundler and Ruby Gems as default stuff baked into Ruby, so hopefully this doesn't become as awkward, but this is the command that you would normally push, use back in the day to um, push gems to rubygems.org. And this is like the only way to trigger, hey, give me your credentials so we can stash this. So maybe this will be better in the future. But anyway, we set our credentials. Let's try one more time. Break release. Um, it rebuilds the same gem fi file for us. Um, it c complains that we already have a tag made and pushed up, so it just kind of skips over it. But it does actually say that we pushed RB21 version 0.1.0 to rubygems.org. And when we go to the internet, this is what you will actually see. So this is an actual gem that was built. It's available for everybody. Rubygems.org will extract out the gem spec file uh, for us, read through the human readable bits of information as well as the dependencies. And this is where the title comes from, where the version number comes from, the description that we put in, um, all the known release versions as well as the dependencies, both um, development and runtime. If this gem had any runtime dependencies, it would be listed next to that. Um, further on, we could specify a, a required Ruby version in the gem spec that's not set by default. If you notice on the far right side, uh, required Ruby version is greater than zero. You can actually say in the gem spec, this is only workable on 2.5 and later, for example. And that's more or less it. I mean, a gem is just Ruby code, just put in very specific ways. Probably the more, most complex part of it is the gem spec, which outlines where the gem, you know, where the require path should be, the name of the gem, and any of the dependencies that have to be loaded up first. Bundler and Ruby gems nowadays pretty much handles that all for us. Um, way, way back in the 1.8 days, um, gems weren't even a thing. So just going from 1.8 to today with the leaps that we've done is kind of incredible, especially because with Bundler, you don't even need to remember, remember how the scaffolding is set up. You don't need to know how to bootstrap our spec in a non-Rails-like environment if you ever um, just use our spec inside of Rails, for example. It's just kind of all there for you. And that's more or less it about the, the talk. Um, a copy of these slides are at uh, the top Git repo. Um, if you want to mess around with the gym, the pr whole purpose of me making RB21 is for if junior devs want to actually try to mess with the gym and try to, you know, contribute to, contribute to a gym, this is nice, safe, no one's going to really use this gym, so if something messes up, it's not the end of the world type of project. Um, so anyway, it's up there at that Git repo, and now that you know that, you can um, pretty much pretend that you're a magician to all your coworkers at this point. Uh, any uh, questions? All right, thank you.